1549, runway 4, clear for takeoff. Cactus 1549, clear for takeoff. I'll never get over how beautiful it is up here. Life's easier in the air. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is a Cactus 1549. Lost thrust on both engines. We are turning back towards the Guardia. No one warned us. No one said you were going to lose both engines at a lower altitude than any jet in history. This was dual engine loss at 2,800 feet, followed by an immediate water landing with 155 souls on board. No one has ever trained for an incident like that. We're going to end up in the Hudson. I'm sorry, say again, Cactus? This is the captain. Brace for impact. My name is Jeff Skiles, and that handsome Hollywood actor with the amazingly full head of hair was playing me in the movie Sully. Now, the movie was about the personal struggle that Sully and I faced in the investigation that ensued after the accident. But what the movie didn't highlight was how the investigation brought forth the successes of the airline industry over the last several decades that has led to our amazingly safe accident record, specifically in fostering professionalism, training, and process that creates a structure around our employees, allowing them to deliver at their highest level. Within our industry, the miracle on the Hudson was not seen as a failure because the airplane crashed. Rather, it was seen as a success because the dramatic landing on the Hudson River uh, avoided the adverse outcome, passenger death or serious injury. The miracle on the Hudson was studied for lessons to be learned by industries as diverse as medicine and oil field management. Even the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission profiled the miracle on the Hudson in its Safety Culture Communicator publication, lauding the industry for the tenets of a positive safety culture, including uh, problem identification and resolution, work processes, continuous learning and training, respectful work environment, and a questioning attitude. The, the, the very foundations of what the airline industry has built in its safety management system. The truth is, is that the airline industry in the United States is amazingly safe. The last fatal accident in the U.S. was 21 years ago in 2001. And this in a country that has over 10 million commercial flights each and every year. This didn't happen by accident. It happened with purpose, by not just striving to meet the letter of the law, but by daring to dream of a day when we would far exceed the requirements of regulators. I think that there are many parallels between aviation and cybersecurity. We both work in an environment where sudden disruptions require immediate and coordinated action. We're viewed as industries where there's no acceptable margin for error. Even a 1% failure rate is unacceptable. And on a personal level, we work in industries where your entire career can be judged on your performance of one moment of time, or in my case, 208 seconds, the time between impacting a flock of Canada geese and landing in the cold January waters of the Hudson River. In aviation, we've created a, a resilient safety management system by focusing on, on the cockpit. As Lumu Technologies point, puts it, being proficient, not just current. For myself, as a pilot, currency is making three takeoffs and landings every 90 days. Proficiency is delivering a safe, comfortable, and uneventful flight every single time. But proficiency is, is even more than that. Proficiency is being prepared for the worst, even though you may not expect it. Proficiency is planning ahead for the unlikely scenario. I'll give you an example that 
I use every time I fly. In our simulator training, one of the most commonly failed maneuvers is what we call the go-around. Tower tells you to go around because there's an airplane on the runway. It's sudden, it's unexpected, and it requires you to react immediately. How do you prepare for that? Well, the proficient pilot plans for the unexpected. Proficient pilots run through that procedure in their heads uh, or even voice it to the other pilots uh, as they're coming in and descending to land. I'll simply say, if we have to do a go around, I'll call go around, flaps 20, positive rate, gear up, set missed approach altitude at 500 feet LNAV at 1,000 feet VNAV. Now you don't need to know what all that means other than understanding that preparing for the uncommon event is part of being a complete and proficient pilot or cybersecurity expert. Now Sully is the most capable and proficient airline pilot that I've ever flown with. He pays attention to the smallest of details, and he certainly represents the finest of our profession. In an interview uh, that I heard once, Sully equated his career to a bank account where he spent decades making small deposits of knowledge, of skill, of technique, so that over the Hudson River, he could make one very large withdrawal. But that didn't happen by accident. The airline world is a bit different than many industries. Decisions that can have a great effect on operations, safety, even profits, often filter down to frontline employees like those of us in the cockpit. In the airline cockpit, there's no ability to find out what your boss wants to do about a problem. You must make a decision and you must live with the consequences. And this is why it's critically important for pilots to be armed with the procedures and systems to help them be successful and be prepared through extensive training to use those systems properly. When I first entered the industry 36 years ago now, we didn't have any of the tools we needed to address an emergency of this order. Safety efforts had been primarily focused on making the airplanes better, safer, and more reliable. But we found that accidents still persisted. As the industry eliminated mechanical factors for accidents, one glaring cause remained, pilot error. The term used for an accident not caused by circumstance or by mechanical failure, but by human mistake. We hadn't placed any emphasis on making the people better and giving them the tools to operate and interact with technology. We had a vertical management system dating to the early days of aviation, a, uh, a system where uh, the captain often would, had uh, ruled his cockpit by uh, author authoritarian rule. As a first officer, I would be hesitant to point out an error to a captain, and nobody had ever heard of a safety management system. Being a pilot was really more of a trade than a profession, and there was little standardization of process in the cockpit. We had a safety management system that was limited by the capabilities of the person in charge, the captain. But it was understood that the industry had to do better. Airliners traveling at close to the speed of sound, seven miles up in the air, were simply too complex and fast paced for one person to control like in the early days of aviation. In the late 1980s, United Airlines pioneered what was then called cockpit resource management. They gave their pilots training uh, and to you know, and be trained in interpersonal skills to communicate and to work together as a team and to accept the appreciate the value of all employees and the role in that they play in delivering the product to our customers. My airline, U.S. Airways, quickly followed. We learned that a captain has resources, the cockpit and the cabin crew, most obviously, uh, but also many others, 
in delivering the products to our customers. You have air traffic controllers, maintenance personnel, uh, dispatchers, people who he can draw upon for information to inform decision making. It really took a decade or more to change our ingrained culture. Some who couldn't make the adjustment uh, simply left in retirement. But we eventually understood that the cockpit and cabin crews were a cohesive team and we could depend on each other to deliver a product that was greater than the sum of its parts. But safety improvements still had a long way to go. We had to get every pilot following the same procedures, not doing their own uh, thing in the cockpit. This was done by developing standard operating procedures to allow us to work together as a team with everyone doing this, things the same way every single time. I'll give you one small example of the myriad uh, structured procedures that we use to trap errors every day. 30 years ago, we had a problem with uh, rapid descent approaches, a situation where the air traffic controller would keep us too high or the pilot would simply misjudge his approach and he'd be attempting to land the airplane too fast with too high a sink rate. I remember they would put up posters in the crew room to warn us of this and to tell us basically not to do it, but it didn't really affect the the rate. We weren't able to diminish the number of these high descent approaches. So instead, we could created a procedure. The airplane has an automatic uh, call out that comes over the speakers from our radar altimeter system. At a thousand feet on descent to landing, a automated voice will call out 1000. We use that to create a gate for decision making. At a thousand feet, when I come into land, I have to have the landing gear down, the flap set for landing, the before take before landing checklist complete. Uh, we have to be within our a uh, thousand. Uh, we have to have a uh, descent rate of less than a thousand feet per minute, and our airspeed has to be no greater than ten knots faster than our ref speed, and no less than five knots below our ref speed. If I see all of that, all of those param parameters, I have to voice it. I have to say stable. And if I can't say stable, I have to say go around. And we go around and come back and try again. At 500 feet, the pilot monitoring also goes through that litany, makes those checks and says stable. This is a means of creating a decision gate in a safe position rather than having us try to land the airplane uh, too fast or too high a descent rate. We reduce or eliminate simple human errors by using two brains and two sets of eyes to cross check all critical inputs. We reduce or eliminate, uh, we brief uh, for each other for every takeoff approach and landing so that both pilots are on the same page. And we're not afraid to say that we make mistakes because we're, we are human. But we find ways to mitigate those threats, to avoid the resultant adverse outcome. But this is not just a one-time effort. Just as we have a constantly changing environment, we have a learning safety management system. The industry has always been good at at learning from accidents. We have an entire arm of the federal government, the National Transportation Safety Board, charged with investigating accidents and proposing changes to make sure that they never happen again. But we can, but we, how can we learn from incidents to prevent accidents? How can we learn from those mistakes that are caught before anyone is harmed? In aviation, we constantly sample and track the mistakes and errors that are occurring in the pilot group and creating threats to safety. We use a variety of methods to identify threats in our environment. 
but a primary one is by asking ourselves. We self-report mistakes. If I level out at the wrong altitude, for instance, and possibly cause a conflict with another aircraft, I will report that error. Now, why would I do that? Why would I tell my employer that I made a mistake? Because it is so important to find out what these threats are, some of them simply because people are human, that we actually have a signed legal agreement between our pilots association, the federal regulators, and our airline saying that if we report mistakes that we make, why we made them, what we think were contributory, contributory factors, we are, uh, we are absolved of any responsibility for them. We don't hide our errors. We're eager to report them because of that immunity. Give up the ability to reprimand or punish the individual for merely being human and making human mistakes to give safety manners, managers greater knowledge of the threats that are faced by all in the workplace. We also have flight deck observers that audit. They sit in our jump seats and watch every single thing we do. And the aircraft themselves also automatically report certain parameter exceedances, like those excessive descent rates to near the ground that I used in an earlier example. These reports are all de-identified. Our names are removed by a gatekeeper before being passed on for analysis. The corporation has a separate safety department that's a direct report to the president. And the safety department compiles and tracks this data to watch for trends, for threats to safety experienced not by the individual, but by the group. The goal isn't to test or evaluate us as individuals. If one pilot makes a small error that's trapped by procedure, it's unimportant. If 10 pilots are making the same mistake at the same point in the flight, it demands an organizational response. We need to change something that we're doing. When a threat warrants, war uh, the safety department develops a procedure or a mitigating strategy to trap that threat. Most people learn from their own experiences or anecdotally, <clears throat> excuse me, from those of others. Through these mechanisms, we learn from the collective experiences of the group. At the time of this accident, over 5,000 pilots at US Airways. We utilize all manner of tools in the cockpits to guard against threats and mistakes, checklists, required callouts, quick reference handbooks of emergency procedures, briefings before takeoff and landing, and cockpit flows. We use these to trap errors. We accept that pilots are human beings and human beings make mistakes. I make mistakes every time I fly, but they're unimportant because they're caught by a checklist, by a flow, by a procedure, or by one of the other pilots. We enhance the best that humans have to offer and we compensate for the worst. From a 30,000 foot level, we evaluate the mistakes that people make. We devise procedural solutions to trap those mistakes, to create a barrier to error before they ever lead to an adverse outcome. Every year, a pilot attends a week-long training cycle of classroom and simulator events, introducing new procedures or focusing and emphasizing existing procedures of the sampling of the pilot group shows that they are just proved lax in following. While we do still demonstrate maneuvers like we used to, engine failures on takeoff, instrument approaches, steep turn stalls, for instance, now the emphasis on our training is on problem solving on utilizing resources, decision-making, managing time, creating barriers to error. Change becomes constant within the organization as new threats are identified and new procedures are implemented. We created the team and it's far larger than the flight and the cabin crew. We gave them the tools and guidance to act correctly, even in crisis and we constantly watch for threats 
to success and create barriers to those threats. That's how you learn and grow as an organization. And that's how you continuously improve and use today's adversity to be better tomorrow. Now, this is to take nothing away from Sully. He's an accomplished aviator and a remarkable man. He's the team leader who brings this all together, the tip of the spear in a far greater effort. In fact, all those years ago, Sully actually wrote and taught the first cockpit resource management classes at my airline. So what do I want you to take away from this? Sully and I were prepared and trained to handle this extreme crisis. We were prepared and trained because of the leadership shown at all levels of the airline, because of the willingness of the airline to look inward and question what we do and continuously change to meet developing threats, and to place primary emphasis on supporting frontline employees like Sully and I in the cockpit so that we can be successful, because our success is organizational success. So let's bring this back to the cockpit that day over the Hudson. 20 years ago, Sully would have been incredibly task saturated. He would have had to have flown the airplane, been responsible for restarting the engines, had to do everything really, while I would be relegated to little more than an assistant waiting for orders that he was far too busy to command. Today, we both fly the airplane with integrated checklists, systems, and procedures. In this case, all I had to hear was Sully say, my aircraft. And that's our standard terminology for transferring control. He flew the airplane, but I knew that my role had changed to one of pilot monitoring. And that has specific tasks that I have to perform, particularly in emergencies. I immediately picked up my quick reference handbook and found the proper emergency checklist to prepare us for a crash landing. Our flight attendants in back only had to hear Sully say over the public address telephone, brace for impact to start into their emergency preparedness planning. They chant, brace, brace, heads down, stay down, brace, brace, heads down, stay down, over and over and over again to get the passengers in the proper position for a crash landing. There wasn't a lot of verbal communication over the river. We never made eye contact, but we knew what was in each other's heads. We accomplished our individual roles, but we also worked together seamlessly in a very stressful situation. Even in the most challenging circumstances that I will ever experience, communication did not break down. The team did not break down. And this didn't occur from years of working together. I had never flown with Sully before this trip. I only met him three days before uh, the miracle on the Hudson. It was our training, our procedures, our systems, the tools provided to us by airline management. We had spent decades making the machine safer, but only by focusing on our people and giving them the tools to be successful and work with our amazing technology could we truly achieve safety in the airline industry. That's my presentation on the miracle in the Hudson. Thank you for allowing me to share it with you. And I'd also like to thank the LUMU team and give RV the opportunity to ask some questions. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so inspirational and remarkable history that you have shared with us today. I want to thank you for taking some time of your busy schedule to share that with us and with our audience and, and go a little bit uh, deeper into avoiding and managing a crisis. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, what advice would you give to others when it comes to responding to the unexpected? You know, uh, it kind of sounds trite to say, expect the unexpected, but that's our job, my job and your job. We need to accomplish 
uh, the everyday uh, activities of our employment, but we also need to be prepared for that moment when our entire careers can hang in the balance. Thank you. I think when, when we translate that into cybersecurity, right, we as cybersecurity professionals day in and day out are also um, fighting the unexpected, right? That alert, that small sign that one of our assets is contacting adversarial infrastructure that may end in a catastrophe. So that that's kind of the analogy. Um, next question would be um, how this experience influence you or change your way of thinking uh, afterwards? I guess I gained a, a tremendous appreciation for the preparation and training that I have received uh, from my airline. I would be the first one to tell you that, you know, in an emergency, I wouldn't remember anything, you know, uh, that I'd be grasping for straws. But what I found out is that you remember everything. Your education, your training, and your planning come to you when you need it. Cool. Um, you know, translating that into cybersecurity, we see uh, day in and day out that when a ransomware incident, that is very popular today, or when a breach incident and data is infiltrated, you know, the companies take cybersecurity more seriously. But I think what we have learned from you today is uh, the consistent process, uh, those small deposits that you do in the, in the bank can allow you to make a large withdrawal um, to prevent uh, a catastrophe. Uh, so that's something that we definitely need to learn more in cybersecurity, how to build this consistency um, in, in building uh, reliability into the processes that the cybersecurity operators um, deal with every day. Here's another question, and it's, it is, it's closer to me because I watch the film. I, I as, as you know, I love uh, flying too. And, and when the wars um, were gone in the Hudson came, did you for a moment think we're not going to make it or did your training enable you to focus on the tasks that you have to do? I, I, I think that the training was very beneficial to us. First, first of all, I always thought it was our best possibility, uh, just simply because if you look at the pictures, you're completely surrounded by a uh, you know, vast urban area. There's just no place to set this airliner down. So. Uh, I always thought that that was our best option. And, and I also always thought that it would be successful too. I never had any doubts, you know, never, never any fear for my life. But, you know, sometimes you just have to, you just have to play the hand that you're dealt. Uh, the river wasn't a great option, but it was there and it was valuable and it's something that we were able to use. Interesting. Um, in cybersecurity, you know, attacks evolve every day. Um, and it's, it's uh, unfair um, for the cybersecurity practitioners to think that a strategy that was planned two years ago or 10 years ago um, is the one that you have to put in place with the attack that you're facing today. I, and I think what is remarkable from what you share today is uh, you deal with the situation at hand and you uh, make possible the best outcome from that situation. That's something that we also have to, um, to do in cybersecurity is to make sure that we deal with the attack that we have facing in that specific uh, moment. So I imagine that going through the post-incident investigation was taxing uh, for you to say the last. Um, how was that process, you know, to, to the point that you can share here, you know, how how taxing was that to be under the microscope of the post crash investigation? It's it's a very thorough investigation, and frankly, it's very intrusive. Uh, for instance, they uh, they called up and they interviewed every every captain that I had flown with for the previous six okay. months before the incident, uh, and uh, the ag investigation actually goes on for a year. Um, but you have to understand what the purpose is. The purpose is good. 
The purpose is to investigate the incident and find out what we can learn to make sure that it doesn't happen again so that we can make aviation safer. safer. So while it's certainly uncomfortable for the people who are involved, like Sully and I, uh, it's, it's a noble purpose. And I think if you keep that in mind, um, which I did at the time, uh, you, you, you really understand that this is necessary and that it's actually helping safety for the airline world and for me in the future. In cybersecurity, as in aviation, right, a safe landing doesn't make any headline, right? Uh, you know, a catastrophe, unfortunately, does a headline. Um, the cybersecurity operator stopping attacks doesn't make uh, the headlines. Uh, the breach, the ransomware attack makes the, the headline. So we, I think we need to get used more to that level of scrutiny. Um, but as, a, as an industry, we have to come together uh, to embrace those uh, post-breach incidents and to learn from those post-breach incidents with the intention to avoid that to happen um, in the future. Now, um, you know, visibility was great that day um, for, for um, the, the landing um, in the Hudson. But in general, I know you, you fly larger airplanes now into some of the most complex uh, airports in the world. And I understand that um, the plane can land uh, with near zero meters of visibility in some airports, like mm -hmm. in Chile, for instance. What's the role of visibility in avoiding um, a catastrophe? Well, uh, you're right. We can land the airplane with uh, essentially zero visibility. The airplane lands itself. Um, I and the airplane will land itself. It'll bring the nose down. Uh, the only time I actually touch the controls is when I knock the autopilot off and put my feet on the brakes as we finally slow down to a taxi speed. That's the capability that we have with airplanes today. Uh, so um, in, in our case, of course, visibility was very good. So it was uh, able, we were able to see the river. We were able to you know, uh, align ourselves with it and, and flare for the touchdown. And a lot of times, though, in vis when we talk about visibility in aviation, we're talking about preparation, planning ahead, seeing that unexpected uh, far ahead so that we can react and change. Uh, if you see a thunderstorm that's on your path 100 miles ahead of time, now is the time to decide. Should we go around it to the left, to the right? Which way is the wind blowing, uh, for instance? How far away from the thunderhead should we plan to be? And then take a radar vector at this point where it's safe to get around it. Uh, visibility is often obviously what we see, but it's also what we plan. In cybersecurity, visibility is so important as well, uh, Jeff, because mm -hmm. it is impossible for a cybersecurity team uh, to defend an asset that we don't know exists in our networks. Mm -hmm. But it's also critically um, important to say that it's impossible to defend attacks against attacks that we don't know are coming our way. So visibility is so important in, in cybersecurity as well. And we're going to go deeper uh, into visibility as this uh, summit evolves. So any practical lessons um, that you learn from the investigation and, not, and that now have been incorporated into the day uh, today of aviation? Yes, you know, uh, I mean, this was, if you want to call it a successful accident, which is kind of a misnomer, but it was. So you might think that there was not much to be learned. Uh, nobody, you know, most of the people walked away. Nobody was seriously injured. But in aviation, uh, we can learn something from virtually any incident. And in fact, in our case, what they discovered was that uh, our checklist, particularly the ones that I was using, weren't really appropriate to the situation. Uh, it was My checklist was three pages long. It involved many things that were critically important, but were at the end of the checklist uh, because it was designed into the scenario of that you, you had time. You were 30,000 feet. You had both engines fail. You had plenty of time to drift down and accomplish it. It wasn't designed to be done at three 
uh, at 3,000 feet in three minutes time. So now we've actually changed our checklist to allow for that. You make the decision, is it time critical or is it not? And that takes you down a different path. And interesting. Um, something that we definitely need to uh, do in cybersecurity uh, as well is to learn from those incidents, is to um, incorporate the learning into the day-to-day -day of our cybersecurity operations. My next question, uh, it's in uh, regard with some words that I guess the war knew from the film, Sully, right? He said, I couldn't have a better partner that day. And you kind of alluded to that during your speech. What do you think, what did the two of you makes make such an effective team that day? Well, a lot of people are surprised at that because as I said, there's 5,000 pilots just at this small airline that I worked for. Uh, and so you, you, people are surprised that we fly with people every day that we don't know. Normally when I go to work, I sit down and I work with people that I have never met before. But that's why it's so critically important to have the system that we can work in, uh, our training, our procedures, our systems. And uh, I, I, I never met Sully before, just three days before that incident. But I knew what he would do in any given circumstance, and he knew the same of me. And that was critically important to us working together as a team. Interesting. Teamwork is such a, um, I guess, such a skill that it's it's needed uh, in cybersecurity as well. I think, um, you know, often ten my prospects and customers, cybersecurity, the cybersecurity team by itself, um, is not going to be able to defend the organization. It's the entire um, uh, group of employees that partner together to defend the organization and what's going to maximize the chances to the cybersecurity team to do a better job. One last question, uh, Jeff. Uh, a last word of advice uh, to people that are making quick decisions to prevent the worst. Well, you have to make quick decisions as you do and as we do. Sometimes it involves trying to slow it down if it's, if it's possible to do that. Uh, what And how do I do that? If I'm going on a, a flight, for instance, to, as I just got back, my last one from Rio de Janeiro, uh, the night before, I'm looking at my charts. I've never been there before. You know, what does the airport look like? What are the approaches? What are, uh, how... You know, how am I going to taxi around? Things like that. Trying to prepare myself for it so that I'm ready to make those quick decisions when I, when I need to. But primarily, it's basically following your training, following your procedures. Those will see you through to success. Preparation, preparation, proficiency in the, in the field. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, it has been such a great pleasure uh, to have you on today, joining the Illumination Summit and getting your insights. And I'm sure that our audience is thrilled. Uh, thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much.